Moby Dick by Herman Melville Chapters 72 and 73 Chapter 72 The Monkey Rope In the tumultuous business of cutting in and attending to a whale, there is much running backwards and forwards among the crew. Now hands are wanted here, and then again hands are wanted there. There is no staying in any one place, for at one and the same time everything has to be done everywhere. It is much the same with him who endeavors the description of the scene. We must now retrace our way a little. It was mentioned that upon first breaking ground in the whale's back, the blubber hook was inserted into the original hole there cut by the spades of the mates. But how did so clumsy and weighty a mass as that same hook get fixed in that hole? It was inserted there by my particular friend Queequeg, whose duty it was, as harpooner, to descend upon the monster's back for the special purpose referred to. But in very many cases, circumstances require that the harpooner shall remain on the whale till the whole tensing or stripping operation is concluded. The whale, be it observed, lies almost entirely submerged, excepting the immediate parts operated upon. So, down there, some ten feet below the level of the deck, the poor harpooner flounders about, half on the whale and half in the water, as the vast mass revolves like a treadmill beneath him. On the occasion in question, Queequeg figured in the Highland costume, a shirt and socks, in which, to my eyes at least, he appeared to uncommon advantage, and no one had a better chance to observe him, as will presently be seen. Being the savage's bowsman, that is, the person who pulled the bow oar in his boat, the second one from forward, it was my cheerful duty to attend upon him while taking that hard scrabble scramble upon the dead whale's back. You have seen Italian organ boys holding a dancing ape by a long cord. Just so, from the ship's steep side, did I hold Queequeg down there in the sea, by what is technically called in the fishery a monkey rope attached to a strong strip of canvas belted round his waist. It was a humorously perilous business for both of us, for before we proceed further, it must be said that the monkey rope was fast at both ends, fast to Queequeg's broad canvas belt, and fast to my narrow leather one, so that, for better or for worse, we two, for the time, were wedded, and should poor Queequeg sink to rise no more, then both usage and honor demanded that instead of cutting the cord, it should drag me down in his wake. So then, an elongated Siamese ligature united us. Queequeg was my own inseparable twin brother, nor could I any way get rid of the dangerous liabilities which the hempen bond entailed. So strongly and metaphysically did I conceive of my situation then, that while earnestly watching his motions, I seemed distinctly to perceive that my own individuality was now merged in a joint-stock company of two, that my free will had received a mortal wound, and that another's mistake or misfortune might plunge innocent me into unmerited disaster and death. Therefore, I saw that here was a sort of interregnum in providence, for its even-handed equity never could have so gross an injustice. And yet, still further pondering, while I jerked him now and then from between the whale and the ship, which would threaten to jam him, still further pondering, I say, I saw that this situation of mind was the precise situation of every mortal that breathes. Only, in most cases, he, one way or other, has this Siamese connection with a plurality of other mortals. If your banker breaks, you snap. If your apothecary by mistake sends you poison in your pills, you die. True, you may say that by exceeding caution, you may possibly escape these and multitudinous other evil chances of life. But handle Queequeg's monkey rope heedfully as I would, sometimes he jerked it so, that I came very near sliding overboard. Nor could I possibly forget that, do what I would, I had only the management of one end of it. Footnote. The monkey rope is found in all whalers, 
but it was only in the Pequod that the monkey and his holder were ever tied together. This improvement upon the original usage was introduced by no less a man than Stubb, in order to afford the imperiled harpooner the strongest possible guarantee for the faithfulness and vigilance of his monkey rope holder. End of footnote. I have hinted that I would often jerk poor Queequeg from between the whale and the ship, where he would occasionally fall from the incessant rolling and swaying of both. But this was not the only jamming jeopardy he was exposed to. Unappalled by the massacre made upon them during the night, the sharks, now freshly and more keenly allured by the before-pent blood which began to flow from the carcass, the rabid creatures swarmed round it like bees in a beehive. And right in among those sharks was Queequeg, who often pushed them aside with his floundering feet, a thing altogether incredible, were it not that, attracted by such prey as a dead whale, the otherwise miscellaneous carnivorous sharks will seldom touch a man. Nevertheless, it may well be believed that, since they have such a ravenous finger in the pie, it is deemed but wise to look sharp to them. Accordingly, besides the monkey rope with which I now and then jerked the poor fellow from too close a vicinity to the maw of what seemed a peculiarly ferocious shark, he was provided with still another protection. Suspended over the side in one of the stages, Tashtego and Dagu continually flourished over his head a couple of keen whale spades, wherewith they slaughtered as many sharks as they could reach. This procedure of theirs, to be sure, was very disinterested and benevolent of them. They meant Queequeg's best happiness, I admit, but in their hasty zeal to befriend him, and from the circumstance that both he and the sharks were at times half hidden by the blood-muddled water, those indiscreet spades of theirs would come nearer amputating a leg than a tail. But poor Queequeg, I suppose, straining and gasping there with that great iron hook, Poor Queequeg, I suppose, only prayed to his yojo, and gave up his life into the hands of his gods. Well, well, my dear comrade and twin brother, thought I, as I drew in and then slacked off the rope to every swell of the sea, what matters it, after all? Are you not the precious image of each and all of us men in this wailing world? That unsounded ocean you gasp in is life, those sharks your foes, those spades your friends, and what between sharks and spades, you are in a sad pickle and peril, poor lad. But courage, there is good cheer in store for you, Queequeg. For now, as with blue lips and bloodshot eyes, the exhausted savage at last climbs up the chains, and stands all dripping and involuntarily trembling over the side, the steward advances, and with a benevolent, consolatory glance, hands him, what, some hot cognac? No. Hands him, ye god, hands him a cup of tepid ginger and water. Ginger? Do I smell ginger? Suspiciously asked Stubb, coming near. Yes, this must be ginger, peering into the as yet untasted cup. Then, standing as if incredulous for a while, he calmly walked toward the astonished steward, slowly saying, Ginger! Ginger! And will you have the goodness to tell me, Mr. Doughboy, where lies the virtue of ginger? Ginger! Is ginger the sort of fuel you use, Doughboy, to kindle a fire in this shivering cannibal? Ginger! What the devil is ginger? Sea coal? Firewood? Lucifer matches? Tinder? Gunpowder? What the devil is ginger, I say, that you offer this cup to our poor Queequeg here? There is some sneaking temperance society movement about this business, he suddenly added, now approaching Starbuck, who had just come from forward. Will you look at that canakin, sir? Smell of it, if you please. Then, watching the mate's countenance, he added, The steward, Mr. Starbuck, had the face to offer that calamal and jollop to Queequeg there, this instant off the whale. Is the steward an apothecary, sir? And may I ask whether this is the sort of bitters by which he blows back the life into a half-drowned man? I trust not, said Starbuck. It is poor stuff enough. Aye, aye, steward, cried Stubb. 
We'll teach you to drug it, Harpenier. None of your apothecary's medicine here. You want to poison us, do you? You have got out insurance on our lives, and want to murder us all and pocket the proceeds, do you? It was not me, cried Doughboy. It was Aunt Charity that brought the ginger on board, and bade me never give the harpooners any spirits, but only this ginger jub, so she called it. Ginger jub, you gingery rascal, take that, and run along with you to the lockers, and get something better. I hope I do no wrong, Mr. Starbuck. It is the captain's orders, grog for the harpooner on a whale. Enough, replied Starbuck. Only don't hit him again, but, oh, I never hurt when I hit, except when I hit a whale or something of that sort. And this fellow's a weasel. Uh, what were you about saying, sir? Only this. Go down with him, and get what thou wantest thyself. When Stubb reappeared, he came with a dark flask in one hand, and a sort of tea-caddy in the other. The first contained strong spirits, and was handed to Queequeg, the second was Aunt Charity's gift, and that was freely given to the waves. Chapter 73 Stub and Flask Kill a Right Whale, and then have a talk over him. It must be borne in mind that all this time we have a sperm whale's prodigious head hanging to the Pequod's side, but we must let it continue hanging there for a while, till we can get a chance to attend to it. For the present other matters press, and the best we can do now for the head is to pray heaven the tackles may hold. Now, during the past night and forenoon, the Pequod had gradually drifted into a sea, which, by its occasional patches of yellow brit, gave unusual tokens of the vicinity of right whales, a species of the leviathan, that but few supposed to be at this particular time lurking anywhere near. And though all hands commonly disdained the capture of those inferior creatures, and though the Pequod was not commissioned to cruise for them at all, and though she had passed numbers of them near the Crozettes without lowering a boat, yet now that a sperm whale had been brought alongside and beheaded, to the surprise of all, the announcement was made that a right whale should be captured that day if opportunity offered. Nor was this long wanting. Tall spouts were seen to leeward, and two boats, stubs and flasks, were detached in pursuit. Pulling further and further away, they at last became almost invisible to the men at the masthead. But suddenly in the distance they saw a great heap of tumultuous white water, and soon after news came from aloft that one or both the boats must be fast. An interval passed, and the boats were in plain sight, in the act of being dragged right towards the ship by the towing whale. So close did the monster come to the hull, that at first it seemed as if he meant it malice, but suddenly going down in a maelstrom, within three rods of the planks, he wholly disappeared from view, as if diving under the keel. Cut! Cut! was the cry from the ship to the boats, which for one instant seemed on the point of being brought with a deadly dash against the vessel's side. But having plenty of line yet in the tubs, and the whale not sounding very rapidly, they paid out abundance of rope, and at the same time pulled with all their might so as to get ahead of the ship. For a few minutes the struggle was intensely critical, for while they still slacked out the tightened line in one direction, and still plied their oars in another, the contending strain threatened to take them under. But it was only a few feet advance they sought to gain and they stuck to it till they did gain it, when instantly a swift tremor was felt running like lightning along the keel, as the strained line scraping beneath the ship suddenly rose to view under her bows, snapping and quivering, and so flinging off its drippings that the drops fell like bits of broken glass on the water, while the whale beyond also rose to sight, and once more the boats were free to fly. But the fagged whale abated his speed, and, blindly altering his course, went round the stern of the ship, towing the two boats after him, so that they performed a complete circuit. Meanwhile, they hauled more and more upon their lines, till, close flanking him on both sides, Stubb answered Flask with lance for lance, and thus round and round the Pequod the battle went 
while the multitudes of sharks that had before swum round the sperm whale's body rushed to the fresh blood that was spilled, thirstily drinking at every new gash, as the eager Israelites did at the new bursting fountains that poured from the smitten rock. At last his spout grew thick, and with a frightful roll and vomit, he turned upon his back a corpse. While the two headsmen were engaged in making fast cords to his flukes, and in other ways getting the mass in readiness for towing, some conversation ensued between them. "'I wonder what the old man wants with this lump of foul lard,' said Stubb, not without some disgust at the thought of having to do with so ignoble a leviathan. "'Wants with it,' said Flask, coiling some spare line in the boat's bow. "'Did you never hear that the ship, which but once has a sperm whale's head hoisted on her starboard side, and at the same time a right whale's head on the larboard, did you never hear, Stubb, that that ship can never afterwards capsize? Why not? I don't know, but I heard that gamboge ghost of a Fadala saying so, and he seems to know all about ship's charms, but I sometimes think he'll charm the ship to no good at last. I don't half like that chap, Stubb. Did you ever notice how that tusk of his is a sort of carved into a snake's head, Stubb? sink him. I never look at him at all, but if ever I get a chance of a dark night, and he's standing hard by the bulwarks, and no one by, look down there, Flask, pointing into the sea with a peculiar motion of both hands. Aye, will I? Flask, I take that Fadala to be the devil in disguise. Do you believe that cock-and-bull story about his having been stowed away on board ship? He's the devil, I say, the reason why you don't see his tail is because he tucks it up out of sight. He carries it coiled away in his pocket, I guess. Blast him! Now that I think of it, he's always wanting oakum to stuff into the toes of his boots. He sleeps in his boots, don't he? He hasn't got any hammock, but I've seen him lay of nights in a coil of rigging. No doubt. And it's because of his cursed tail. He coils it down, do you see, in the eye of the rigging. What's the old man have so much to do with him for? Striking up a swap or a bargain, I suppose. Bargain? About what? Why, do you see, the old man is hard bent after that white whale, and the devil there is trying to come round him and get him to swap away his silver watch, or his soul, or something of that sort, and then he'll surrender Moby Dick. Pooh, <laughs> Stubb, you are skylarking. How can Fadala do that? I don't know, Flask, but the devil is a curious chap, and a wicked one, I tell you. Why, they say is how he went a-sauntering into the old flagship once, switching his tail about devilish easy and gentlemanlike, and inquiring if the old governor was at home. Well, he was at home, and asked the devil what he wanted. The devil, switching his hoofs, up and says, I want John. What for? says the old governor. What business is that of yours? says the devil, getting mad. I want to use him. Take him, says the governor. And by the Lord, Flask, if the devil didn't give John the Asiatic cholera before he got through with him, I'll eat this whale in one mouthful. But look sharp. Ain't you already there? Well, then pull ahead, and let's get the whale alongside. I think I remember some such story as you were telling, said Flask, when at last the two boats were slowly advancing with their burden towards the ship. But I can't remember where. Three Spaniards? Adventures of those three bloody-minded solados? Did you read it there, Flask? I guess you did. No, never saw such a book. Heard of it, though. But now tell me, Stubb, do you suppose that that devil you were speaking of just now was the same you say is now on board the Pequod? Am I the same man that helped kill this whale? Doesn't the devil live forever? Who ever heard that the devil was dead? Did you ever see any parson wearing a mourning for the devil? And if the devil has a latch-key to get into the admiral's cabin, don't you suppose he can crawl into a porthole? Tell me that, Mr. Flask. How old do you suppose Fadala is, Stubb? Do you see that mainmast there? Pointing to the ship. Well, that's the figure one. Now take all the hoops in the Pequod's hold, and string along in a row with that mast for aughts. Do you see... Well, that wouldn't begin to be Fadala's age. 
nor all the coopers in creation couldn't show hoops enough to make oughts enough. But see here, Stubb, I thought you a little boasted just now that you meant to give Fidala a sea toss, if you got a good chance. Now, if he's so old as all those hoops of yours come to, and if he is going to live forever, what good will it do to pitch him overboard? Tell me that. Give him a good ducking, anyhow. But he'd crawl back. Duck him again, and keep ducking him. Suppose he should take it into his head to duck you, though. Yes, and drown you. What then? I should like to see him try it. I'd give him such a pair of black eyes that he wouldn't dare show his face in the Admiral's cabin again for a long while, let alone down in the Orlop there where he lives, and hereabouts on the upper decks where he sneaks so much. Damn the devil, Flask! So you suppose I'm afraid of the devil? Who's afraid of him? Except the old governor who dares and catch him and put him in double darbies as he deserves, but lets him go about kidnapping people. Ay, and signed a bond with him that all the people the devil kidnapped he'd roast for him. There's a governor. Do you suppose Fidala wants to kidnap Captain Ahab? Do I suppose it? You'll know it before long, Flask. But I am going now to keep a sharp lookout on him. And if I see anything very suspicious going on, I'll just take him by the nape of the neck and say, Look here, Beelzebub, you don't do it. And if he makes any fuss, by the Lord, I'll make a grab into his pocket for his tail take it to the capstan and give him such a wrenching and heaving that his tail will come short off at the stump, do you see? And then, I rather guess, when he finds himself docked in that queer fashion, he'll sneak off without the poor satisfaction of feeling his tail between his legs. And what will you do with the tail, Stubb? Do with it. Sell it for an ox whip when we get home. What else? Now, do you mean what you say and have been saying all along, Stubb? Mean or not mean, here we are at the ship. The boats were here hailed to tow the whale on the larboard side, where fluke chains and other necessaries were already prepared for securing him. Didn't I tell you so? said Flask. Yes, you'll soon see this right whale's head hoisted up opposite that parmacetes. In good time, Flask's saying proved true. As before, the Pequod steeply leaned over towards the sperm whale's head. Now, by the counterpoise of both heads, she regained her even keel. Though sorely strained, you may well believe. So, when on one side you hoist in Locke's head, you go over that way, but now on the other side hoist in Kant's, and you come back again, but in very poor plight. Thus some minds forever keep trimming boat. Oh, you foolish! Throw all these thunderheads overboard, and then you will float light and right. In disposing of the body of a right whale, when brought alongside the ship, the same preliminary proceedings commonly take place as in the case of a sperm whale. Only in the latter instance the head is cut off whole, but in the former the lips and tongue are separately removed and hoisted on deck, with all the well-known black bone attached to what is called the crown piece. But nothing like this in the present case had been done, the carcasses of both whales had dropped astern, and the head-laden ship not a little resembled a mule carrying a pair of overburdening panniers. Meantime, Fadala was calmly eyeing the right whale's head, and ever and anon glancing from the deep wrinkles there to the lines in his own hand. And Ahab chanced so to stand that the Parsi occupied his shadow, while if the Parsi's shadow was there at all, it seemed only to blend with and lengthen Ahab's. As the crew toiled on, Laplandish speculations were bandied among them concerning all these passing things. End of chapters 72 and 73